All right, so look, we in, we in Revelation. This is the last chapter of the book of Revelation. I think, uh, I think what we're going to do after this, we'll probably go on a few weeks before we get going back to the Old Testament and talk about um, the finished work of the Christ, amen, get into a little bit of Romans, try to do that uh, pretty much every time that I'll finish like a little series because that's, that's kind of like what, uh, what the Lord, you know, that's where he started it all, amen, for, most, for a lot of us in here, Romans chapter 6. Somebody told me the other day, I don't know if y'all heard, but Brother Lauren mentioned us again on the, on the little TV. I guess it was the Sunday night service they were having. Danielle sent me the little Facebook thing, 48 minutes and 36 seconds. And uh, so that was pretty cool. He didn't really say our name, but he said we were in Patterson. And he said a little bit about that, about Agna Ao and the Bible study and all that stuff was real good. But uh, what was interesting was I kept listening to it. And I think somewhere around 53 minutes or something, he started saying something about the message of the cross and how so oftentimes people feel as though they, they can talk about it and that they, that, you know, they can. And he, I think he might have even said speak the lingo. And I think he might have said something about he didn't say Sister Francis, but he said, yeah, well, what I'm trying to talk about is, is kind of like there's somebody in this place that talked about the fact that you sound like you can preach the cross. He was talking to Brother Swagger. You can preach the cross, but you, why can't you live the cross? Like she was getting on him. <laughs> so anyway, I thought that was pretty funny. But, I mean, it's true, is it not? For all of us, each and every one of us. We get so self-righteous. Oh, man, we know something nobody else knows. But, Lord, help us to be humble that the truth of that message will enter into our hearts. And, you know, what is the essence of the message of the cross? Because we've got to clarify that. Because a lot of times people think that they know what we're talking about. Because some people be like, duh, everybody knows the message of the cross. No, I'm sorry, my friend. I don't think that that's true. You know, a lot of people understand the cross as it regards salvation, Right? But a lot of people don't understand the cross or the finished work of the Lord as it regards sanctification, our growth in Christ. And so what we need as children of God to be able to grow in Christ, to be able to have victory in our life, is we need a flow of the Holy Spirit ministering on the inside, giving us strength. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like what I'm trying to get at is, is that there's things in life. There's, there's trials and there's struggles and there's things that go on in life that you and your own strength and in your own flesh, no matter how well you mean, are not going to be able to overcome uh, some of these areas of the flesh in your own strength. Really, you're not supposed to try to do any of that in your own strength. And, and what you and I, the, so the power source now is supposed to be the Holy Spirit moving and operating in the life of the believer. Well, the way that the Holy Spirit moves and operates in the life of the believer is through faith. Through faith in what Jesus did, the old man born of Adam stays dead. The new man resurrected in Christ receives grace from the Holy Spirit, which strengthens him and encourages him and gives him the victory in his life. Now, the opposite of that is, and this is what we've been taught many times in the church, um, and, if you, and if you've been in the, in the faith any length of time, you should kind of have an idea of what I'm saying, is that We've been taught, okay, you got saved. Now, look, these are all the things you got to do as a Christian. And without even meaning to, many well-intentioned pastors and preachers have taught a works-based faith. Faith in works. You understand what I'm saying? Faith in works instead of faith in the work. That's a big deal. I mean, I, look, it might be, look, it might even be get you tired and make you want to go night-night. I mean, I don't know. It shouldn't. You ought to be getting fired up and excited. But what I'm trying to say is this. It's a big deal. If you find yourself struggling in your walk with the Lord, sometimes it's because the object of our faith isn't focused on the right thing. You know, if my faith is focused in the work that the Lord has already done when he defeated the works of, of darkness, then guess what? I'm my, my old man, the, the idea behind this is that my old man is staying in a state of de being dead. Does that make sense? Because the old man that was born the first time of Adam, when he gets born again, in the mind of God, he dies with Christ. So the old man born of Adam physically dies. The one that was bound by sin in its first birth dies in Christ. And so when my faith stays in what Jesus did, amen, then that old man stays dead and the new man is, is stays resurrected and we begin to walk in resurrection life. It's a faith walk. Does that make sense? 
you, you understand what faith is, right? I mean, when your faith is to believe in something, you can't necessarily, it's not, it's not necessarily doing something. Yes, people that are believing something are often, are doing something, but you don't do in order to get victory. You believe for victory that what Jesus did is going to give you the access to the grace that you need. And as you believe that, now the Holy Spirit works in your heart and in your life. And as he frees you, you begin to have a desire to do for the Lord. Does that make sense? I hope it does. Because I'm just so ever grateful for the Lord showing up and revealing those things to me. Amen. Naya, you got some help lately coming up? Yes. yes. Praise God. And anybody that can, when you got help coming? Friday. Friday. All right. You got, you got you, you by yourself? Nice. Anybody else want to help Naya over the next few days? Naya needs some help. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. All right. Praise God. All right, here we go. Revelation chapter 22, starting in verse 1. Let's just go ahead and read, read through the chapter, and we'll, we'll talk about some things if they need to be talked about. It says, Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming down, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street on either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing fruit, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. That's interesting to me. We're going to talk about that a little bit more here in a second. But, uh, you know, I just think that also it's interesting when we're talking about nations and we're talking about 12 kinds of fruit every month. And, you know, I checked back on the Jewish calendar to make sure every now and then they got an extra month because they're, the timing is a little bit different on a lunar calendar. But basically there's... There's 12 months also on the Jewish calendar. And so we see this number 12 repeatedly. Number 12 shows up a lot in the Bible. There were 12 tribes, 12 sons of Jacob that became the 12 tribes of Israel. And a lot of times the number 12 is interconnected to the concept of government and uh, definitely God's government. But you also heal here at the end of this verse for the healing of the nations. And so that's interconnected with government. We'll, we'll kind of mention a little bit of that here in a second. But there will no longer be any curse. And the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his bondservants will serve him. They will see his face. Isn't that something? We were just singing a song, and I could hear Naya singing, we want to see your face. We want to see, how does that song go? Holy is, we want, to, we want to see you. I know that that's, we want to see you is, is what the song, and I, was, I had really focused on this verse while I was studying they will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and there will no longer be any night. They will not have need of the light of a lamp, nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. And he said to me, these words are faithful and true, and the Lord, the God of the spirits, of the prophets. Isn't that something? I mean, I don't know if, if stuff like that catches y'all's eye, but when I read stuff like that, it just kind of like encourage just certain things stick out to me. The the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets. That's powerful. I mean, it may not mean a lot when you just read it on the surface, but when you understand all of the years and all of the work that God has put into the word of God and its presence on earth and how God through his word reveals his truth to mankind. You know, without this Bible, we'd be in a world of hurting people. We would not have, we would not be able to know about God. Amen. And sometimes I think we take it, we take that for granted. But but the, the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. And behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed me these things. That's, uh, but he said to me, do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who heed the words of this book, worship God. Isn't that something, too? I mean, think about that. You know, I, mean, I don't know if, it, sometimes we just read over it, but, I mean, he, 
this is an angel. This is the angel of the Lord that has kind of been involved in the whole book of Revelation. You know, it, it says it in the beginning chapter that, that this, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which was given to him by God, and, and then it was disseminated through the angel, and that this angel's been involved in all of these, like been right there with John, it seems like, the whole time, and speaking to him. And whenever John sees all of this as we're nearing the end, he, he just bows down in reverence to this angel and the angel's like no what are, you, what are you doing don't do this you know you don't worship angels amen he says I, but look what he says he says he says i am your fellow i'm a fellow servant of yours and of your brethren the prophets and of those who heed the words of this book worship god that's just a, such a powerful thought that the angels of God working in unison with the prophets of God, working in unison with the people of God for the work that, that God desires to go forth on the earth. Amen? And there's a lot more that we could say about the fact that, you know, he, that the angel would not allow himself to be worshipped. I, I mean, I don't, I don't like getting into this, but we don't, we don't spend that much time in this one particular chapter. So while we're here, you know, I'll tell you this, that, you know, the, that the Mormons, people don't like to hear you kind of come against things, but some things have just need to be come against, okay? Because the Mormons believe that Jesus and, 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 and Lucifer are brothers, okay? And, and Lucifer is a fallen angel. So basically, the Mormon church is putting Jesus on the same level as an angelic being, as a created being. The Jehovah's Witnesses, they won't tell you this till they've been in your house about five or six times. And, and, and then, but once they've been in there, then at some point in time it might come out that they believe that Jesus is actually the incarnation or the fulfillment, the manifestation of the archangel Michael. And so, but whenever you get into Revelation chapter 5 and it talks about wor- the 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 congregation in heaven worshiping God and the Lamb. They lay prostrate before him, and they worship the Lamb. And that's one of the big ones that I use on them whenever they come knock on my door. Uh, I, I say, well, no, you know, no, sir, because, I mean, I'd spent a lot of time in this, and, but, you know, they actually changed the word in Revelation uh, from worship to obedience to take the edge off. But it's, the, it's a long story, but, but I'm, it, where it says also in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6, he says, let the, all the angels of God worship him. It, they, they changed the word to obedience instead of worship, but there's another spot where they use the word worship, but it's always the same Greek word. It's proskunio. And so to me, that's a bait and switch kind of tactic. That's a purposeful manipulation because, see, they train their people to read the Bible very much. I told you all that story before, right, about that time. I I know I did. Y'all might have forgot. But one time I was sitting under the old oak tree where I used to listen to Brother Larson, and my nephew was dating my nephew had married this Jehovah Witness girl, and, uh, and anyway, I got into a long conversation with her about some things, and it sparked this kind of journey where I started talking to one of the elders in their church for about a three-week period, and I was sitting under the oak tree, and all of a sudden, I felt like the Lord overwhelmed me. I only had a, a certain amount of time for lunch, and I felt like the Lord said, go to that kingdom hall and get another one of those uh, New World translations. I already had one, but it was like very clear. Go to that kingdom hall. Dude, don't you love it when the Lord speaks? to you clear like that. And I'm like, well, I got about an hour. It's all the way over there. Okay, so I did, man. I was in my car already. It was cranked up. I drive over there to the Jehovah Witness, to the Kingdom Hall, and I'm walking around, and I don't know, okay, Lord, I'm here. Um, You know, I'm looking around. I kind of walk around the building. I look at their little sign outside. You know, it's locked. I'm like, well, I don't know, man. Maybe I missed the Lord. So I get ready to go get in my car, and here comes this kid drive up. He's about 19 years old. I'm like, hey, man, is one of the elders here? No, sir, but he's on his his way right now. And I'm like, oh, okay. Well, that's great. So I said, um, so he shows up right there. And I, and I said, hey, man, I said, look, uh, do, do you happen to have, and I told him the truth. I said, look, man, I'm a Christian. I've been on the phone with one of y'all's elders. Uh, and uh, I, I got a, one New World Translation, but, but I'd like to get another one if that's possible. Do you have one? He said, oh, man, they're, they're in the shed in the back, and I, I don't have one of the keys. And so, oh, oh, I forgot to tell y'all this. Get one. Of, the Lord told me, get one of those New World Translations and go inside that building. 
So, so I said, hey, you know, and he said, oh, man, I don't have, you know, I don't have a key to the shed. And I'm like, oh, okay. I said, but hey, you mind if I go inside your building and take a look around? <laughs> He's like, uh, oh, okay. So he lets me in there. And I mean, whatever, it's a long, it's, it could be a long story. They didn't have any windows. <laughs> but, uh, but whenever I walked into the sanctuary and I looked up on the stage, what was interesting to me was they kind of had a pulpit like this, but it was off to the side. But in the middle of the stage, they had a table. Y'all remember me telling y'all this story? They had a table with two chairs, and they had one of those little microphones that sits on top of the table. And immediately I knew what that was. I, and I asked him, I said, sir, that table right there, yes, that's our, that's our theocratic school of ministry. I said, well, sir, let me just ask you a question. That's where y'all role play in your service. You'll have one of the leaders and you'll have one of the congregation ministers, minister, members play the role of a person in your inside their house at their kitchen table. Is that correct? He said, yes, that's what we do. And so it just blew me away because what the point is, is that like I was like, man, these people are working so hard to reach, to reach the world with this false doctrine where they're trying to teach that Jesus is the manifestation of the archangel Michael. And, and they know the Bible, I hate to tell you this, a lot better than most Christians. And so they come in there and they start feeding people lies and they start causing confusion, you know, and, and then the next thing you know, they got somebody caught up in false doctrine. And then and it's a horrible spirit. It, it, it's very demonic. I'm just going to tell you that right now. Because, listen, the first time I talked to that guy on the phone, I probably told you all this too. I think this kind of stuff is interesting. But anyway, I'm driving down the road and the first time I talked to him, Y'all know me, how I don't really, I'm never lost for words. I could not say a word. I had, like, all of a sudden a blockade on my brain, and, like, I, like a spirit of confusion came over me. And then I began to speak in tongues under my breath. I began to pray in tongues in the spirit. And the next thing you know, <laughs> I opened my mouth, and I never shut it for three weeks. <laughs> I never shut it for three weeks till I finally got him mad and told him he was following after a doctor and the demons. And he got mad at me, and he said whatever, and he hung up the phone. And I don't think that this is necessarily has anything to do with it. I'm just telling you what happened. It was about a month later he, he, died. he, he didn't die. He got into a wreck. He was driving, and his wife died. But anyway, I don't, I'm not saying that those two things are connected, but it was all kind of weird. All right, so. Nevertheless, the point is, is this, is that what, they, what they're trying to teach is that the archangel Michael, they don't believe that Jesus is deity, and they believe that he's the manifestation of the archangel Michael. And what I'm trying to say is in this passage right here, John, John tries to lay down and to reverence and worship this angel, but the angel does not allow it. Yet at the same time, there are places in the word of God where it talks about the angels worshiping Jesus, other men, men worship Jesus, okay, and Jesus never tells somebody not to worship. But as a matter of fact, whenever he's coming into town riding on the donkey and they're crying, Hosanna, Hosanna to the highest, amen, and they say, make them stop. Do you see what they're doing? And he said, no, because if I make them stop, then the guess what's going to happen. The rocks are going to cry out. So anyway, praise God. I just want y'all to be aware of that in case y'all run into one. All right. He said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book for the time is near. Let the one who does wrong still do wrong. And the one who is filthy, I thought this was very interesting. Let the one who does wrong still do wrong. The one who is filthy still be filthy. Let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness. And the one who is holy still keep himself holy. Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter by the gates into the city. I, I feel like this is kind of interesting too i didn't really put anything in the in the little slides that i have <laughs> but uh, have you ever noticed that i mean whenever you read the bible and you should from time to time i mean sometimes it's good just to read but then sometimes it's very good to stop and to kind of ponder things and to try to be you know what i would call a critical thinker you know what it, what it means is is that when you when you critique things is that you already understand that there's a certain level of things that have been taught at this point. So then 
something kind of makes you start to think, right? And so anybody want to take a stab at like what stood out to me? So he says, blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter by the gates into the city. Um, Anyway, because it talks about the tree of life there. And it talks about, and, and, you know, look, this is after the millennial reign of Christ, right? This is after Satan has been loosed for a short period of time to tempt the nations. This is after he's been thrown into, into the lake of fire, right? And so whenever I see this and it says that they have a right to eat of the tree of life, it just, it's just interesting to me because I guess, like, I don't understand exactly why people will still have to eat from the tree of life because they're in a glorified body. I mean, I'm not here to question it. I mean, it is, it's God's economy. I don't think that we understand everything that we're going, like on this side, I don't think we're going to understand everything, but it's just something that points out, that, that stands out to me, you know, that here we are in glorified bodies, and yet we have to be the ones, it seems like, that, that have washed our robes so that we might have the right to eat uh, from the tree of life by the gates into the city. And it says, outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices lying. Now, that's another thing that kind of stands out to me right there. Because, because again, I, wouldn't, I, I don't see... So we already talked about last week that the city of God, the new Jerusalem, has descended, right? The four-square city, I think we said 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles, came out to like 2 million-something square miles, something like that from what I remember. Um, and that the nations are going to bring their, their, their glory to the Lord into this new Jerusalem. And then this right here is saying outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral. I, I just don't imagine that, you know, that at this point in time that there's a whole bunch of sorcerers left on earth. <laughs> you know what I'm getting at? So that one always threw me for a loop. And then this is just my personal interpretation of what I believe. And I might have even read behind somebody that said it. When I think that the emphatic point here is that meaning outside, it means they're not inside. Yeah, amen. It does not, I don't believe that, that it's a situation where whenever you walk up to the gates that you, that, you know, as the nations bring their glory to the Lord, that they're walking past a bunch of sorcerers and dogs and immoral persons and murderers and idolaters. Now, yes, ma'am. No, because there were two trees in the garden. Yeah, there were two trees in the garden. There was the tree of life, which I believe represents Christ, and then there was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, uh, yeah, so, so the tree of life, though, is I believe that the tree of life, see, they, they, they were able to eat, eat that. And, and who knows what exactly that means, but they had constant access to the tree of life before the fall, and then after the fall, they were banished from Eden, and they were no longer able, because it said specifically that they had to be banished so that they couldn't have access to the tree of life anymore. And so now, that is an interesting point to bring up, though. So now, in the end, we have access again. The people of God have access again to the tree of life. But let me just make a point here. I don't know that I can prove it either way, but it makes sense to me that I don't believe that outside means that you got a bunch of whoremongers and murderers and sorcerers hanging outside the gate of the New Jerusalem. I don't believe that that even exists anymore at this point in time. I believe the main point is, is this, is that because they're outside, it means they're not inside is what's being said here. You understand what I'm saying? Like they're not, they're not part of what God has done. I don't see evil still being on the earth. Yes, I believe evil is still on the earth in the hearts of people laying dormant during the millennial reign of Christ and when Satan is loose to tempt the nations for that short period of time, that that evil is exposed. But then at that point in time, God, yes, sir. No, many people won't. I believe, well, so, and this is more kind of like philosophical, but this would be the idea behind that. So, and we've I've talked about it a few times, but it makes sense to me. That's the only reason why, why else would God allow the enemy to be loose for a period of time to tempt if there's not people that can be tempted. So the idea there would be the, the true church would be raptured, right, at whatever point that you tend to, to believe would be raptured, and then there would be people that are left 
after the rapture, right, that would die, but then there would be definitely some people that would make it. I mean, I mean, there's people that are survivalists and whatnot. I mean, that, that makes sense to me. That, I mean, I can't prove it from the scriptures, but that there would be people that would make it and then the battle of Armageddon come in. In other words, whenever the rapture happened and they realized that God was real and they don't want to be, they were already running and trying to survive from the mark of the beast. They didn't want the mark of the beast and they had not taken the mark of the beast. They don't have a glorified body during the millennial reign of Christ, whereas the true believers have glorified bodies. And I mean, again, I can't prove any of this, but it's just things that I've thought about that that time frame during that millennial reign of Christ, mankind is those human beings are repopulating on the face of the earth. Uh, the, those of us that have glorified bodies are not. We know that because Jesus told that to the Sadducees when they came to him and they tried to tempt him saying, oh, you know, we knew a woman who, had a, who was married and her husband died and then she married his brother and, you know, went through the whole seven of them. And they're like, okay, so in the resurrection, because they didn't believe in the resurrection, the, the whole deal there, the Sadducees. Yes, sir. Yep. Yeah, but this is glor- this is after the millennial reign is what is what that was. Uh, they, well, that's a good question. Do they ever get glorified? Yeah, so yeah, and so maybe maybe that that terminology there having to do with uh, with that they washed their robes is that they made their choice during that short period of time of the. Uh, you know, of whenever the enemy was released to test and to tempt and whatnot. So, yeah, I mean, that's a good point. Um, yeah, so, so again, I, I just to, to finish that thought, like people remultiplying on the face of the earth for a whole thousand years, and I imagine this time frame. To me, it's interesting to think about it because it seems like you would have, say you'd have unglorified people, right, on the earth, and that still have a sinful nature that can be tempted. And then you'd also have glorified human beings on the earth. And, I mean, there's no reason to not believe that we also wouldn't have angelic beings around during that time frame. And so, it, to me, it's just a very interesting thing. And, and the fact that the enemy is going to show up again after that thousand years to be loosed so it it makes sense. It's like a it's like turning a page. You had the Old Testament, you had the New Covenant, then now you have the millennial reign of Christ. And it seems as though it makes sense to me that that the story of the Christ would be being preached again at another level, right? I mean, what I'm saying is in the Old Testament they preach Jesus or Christ that he would come. In the New Testament, we preach that the Christ has come, and in the millennial reign, we would be preaching, hey, listen, he came, he, he came back again, this is what we have, but look, the, the liar's going to be loosed again, and you have to understand that Jesus died for your sin, amen, and so, I mean, we can't prove all of that, but yeah, that's good, I mean, uh, and so, do they ever have glorified bodies, those people that make it through, that make that choice, are they more like Adam and Eve were? You know what I'm saying? So that's, that's, that kind of stuff is just interesting to think about. So, all right. I, Jesus, verse 16, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city which are written in this book. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. So look, if you see, if you don't come on Sunday nights, Wade asking those questions, that's a perfect example of what we try to do on those Sunday night 
Everybody, like, gets to, uh, and I mean, I always wanted Wednesday nights to kind of be like that, what just happened, um, but most of the time, people are a little apprehensive, so I appreciate that, but that's, that's kind of like the atmosphere we've been having on that off-night Bible study, and I think it's a great atmosphere, even though we're getting into some deep stuff right now, I think it's a great atmosphere for new believers to be able to come and to be able to ask other questions, you know what I'm saying, and so, anyway, all right, praise God, so here we are, I wanted to... Uh, so Revelation 22, verse 1, in the first verse, it talked about a river of life. It talked about a river of life and that, you know, we were singing that. I think y'all sang that song last Sunday, the river of life, it, the river of God is teeming with life, and all that touch it will be revived, I believe, you know. Brother Randy Plesloff for a long time had a church in town called River, of, river Life Ministry, and that's the idea behind it, that the presence of God is flowing and everything that it's touching is coming to life and being and and being invigorated coming to life for for the Lord we we talked about John chapter 7 verse 37 through 39 last week also where Jesus was at that feast and he said that those that believe on him that out of their bellies would flow rivers of living water right so to me it's it's really awesome that in the end whenever we're in the presence of God and we're literally living with him and, and dwelling with him that there's a, a, a it sounds like a literal river that's crystal that's flowing from the throne room of God and from the lamb and that is just bringing life and on each side of it, I, I drew a little picture right here. On each side of it is, is the tree of life, and, then, and it bears 12 types of fruit for the healing of the nations. I thought that that was kind of interesting right there. You know, and this is just a more of a, a, a rhetorical type question. Like, why, why, you reckon the healing of, why you reckon the nations need healing? You know, and see, to me, it's just so interesting, all this stuff that we've been studying about it, about in this book. Why? Like, in other words, the nations need healing. Yes, you, you need healing right now. Do you not? We all, we, everybody in this room, we all need healing. I don't care how good we think we look. Oh, but I don't have my physical body, man. I'm feeling good. No, you need healing, my friend. Trust me. You either need healing in your physical body. You need hearing, healing in your spirit, man. You need healing in your emotions emotional life. You need healing in your mind. You need the healing of the Lord. Amen. And listen, the nations also need to be healed by God. Real quick, that just really sticks out to me. Why do the nations need healing? We're not going to go there, but just to remind you of Psalm 82, Deuteronomy 32, 8, for those of us that have been studying that, the Bible teaches, okay, and I've been knowing this for quite some time, but I've never heard it spoken so succinctly as what I have in this book. The Bible teaches that mankind at the Tower of Babel, instead of worshiping God, came together under the leadership of Nimrod and gave their worship, can we just make it simple tonight, to fallen angels that they, that they considered to be false gods. And they gave their worship to these entities. And according to Psalm 82 and Deuteronomy 32.8, it appears that what God said was this. Is this is what you want? If this is what you want, this is what you get. You don't want me to be your God? You don't want to worship me? And they were all of one language, and he confused their languages, and he divided the nations according to the number of the sons of God, which is a high-level angel of some sort. He divided the nations under the leadership of these fallen entities. Just like, listen, why would God do that? Well, why would God even though he knew it wasn't best for Israel, give them Saul as their king when he was training and grooming young David in the sheep field. Why would God do such a thing? Because God created you and I with a free will. And he wants you and I to choose him. Amen? Does that make sense? I'll hold, you can really chew on that for a little while. God wants you to choose him. It, br it brings pleasure to his heart. Why does God receive pleasure and and, and, and Enjoy to know that you, with your free will that he gave you, would willingly give yourself back to him. That's how he chose it to be. And so because the people of Israel cried out and wanted a king named Saul, 
God gave them what it was that they wanted. And God will give mankind what it is that they want. They, they think they want it, but trust me, in the end they don't. And that's really, I don't mean to get off on this, but that's really what Romans 1 is all about. In Romans 1, when the Apostle Paul says in the 16th verse of Romans 1, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto them which believe, for the Jew first, but also unto the Greek. He says, for in it the righteousness of God is being revealed against all ungodliness. And then it talks about men suppressing the truth. And that when men suppress the truth, you know what happens? The wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Not orge wrath, which, or thumos wrath, which is like a breathing slaughter that just destroys humanity that's going to happen whenever the trumpets are blown and the vials are poured. That's a different kind of wrath. This kind of wrath is really what we're kind of talking about right here. The people, of, the people that God created chose to worship false gods, and, and, and just like the, the children of Israel chose a king for themselves because they wanted to be like the other nations, God gave them what they wanted. And just as in, in the New Testament, when the people refused to worship God, and instead they want all kind of stuff, come on, help me out. I'm, I'm preaching better than you're amening because I can tell you right now that each and every one of us in this room are guilty. There's things that we want in our heart and in our life more sometimes than what we want the Lord. And the, Lord, and the Lord's like, if that's what you want, then I'm going to let you have it. Now, my, now, I'm going to tell you, I, I'm speaking for the Lord here because I believe this is his heart after knowing the Bible a little bit. That he would say, and my hope and my desire for you is that after I let you have what you think you want for a little bit, just like whenever the children of Israel said, I'm, I loathe this bread you give us, this manna from heaven, this angel food. I'm, I'm sick, busted, and disgusted over this stuff. And we want some flesh to eat. And the Lord said, okay, I'm going to send a flock of quail your way, and you'll be eating it till you vomit it out your nose. And that's how it is with sin. Listen to me. We, we, we may think we want it, and so that's what happens in Romans 1. They suppress the truth, and God's wrath is poured on them. And you know what happens is there's a spiraling downward of that wrath to the point where you get to the end of chapter 1. You know what happens? Nobody wants to talk about this kind of stuff no more. But can I just tell you what the Bible says? The homosexual community says, oh, Jesus never came against homosexuality. Paul said that the end result of the wrath of God is that men lie with men and women burn for women. And that they change the natural use of a man with a woman that results in procreation. That God told Adam and Eve to multiply on the face of the earth. God told Noah to replenish the earth. God's plan is that mankind would be productive. That his seed would result in fruit. That there would be other human beings that would ha have the opportunity to become part of the family of God. And, and so, again talking about sin, talking about coming under the leadership. Why do the nations need healing? Because the nations desired to worship something other than God, and God gave them in their free will what they thought they wanted. But hallelujah, at the end of the age, they're going to realize and they're going to need healing. Amen? Just like you and I need healing today, that the nations also need healing. We need to pray for this earth. Amen? That and the, leaders, the leadership of, yeah, we know that they're wicked, but that doesn't mean that God can't change them. Amen? The heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord, and he, he turns its course just like a river, like with his finger. He can change the course of a river. He can change the heart of a king. Amen? All right. So there's going to be no more curse. It said that also, I believe it was verse 2, no more curse. And that word curse is anathema in the Greek language, and this is what it means. It's the, desire, the, the, the idea of excommunication, to be consigned to judgment. Isn't that interesting? I mean, if you think about that, when Adam and Eve fell, and because of their fall and the sin that came upon them and that they no longer were allowed to have access to the tree of life, God banished them, excommunicated them from the presence of Eden, from the presence, from his presence, and it says that there will be no more anathema. There will be no more curse. Amen. What a glorious day that, that we will be able to be in the presence of God. Hallelujah. Sometimes whenever you, let you listen, you should, consult, you should console your own self sometimes. <laughs> what are you talking about? What, is a, what does console mean? You need to speak to your own heart sometimes. Because look, sometimes you might find yourself down. We all do. Down and downcast, right? The, the, listen, the psalmist, you know what David said? 
Why are you downcast within me, O soul? He spoke to his own soul. He knew how good God was. Sometimes we get ourselves caught up in some things and we don't understand. Why are you downcast within me, soul? God is worthy, amen, to receive glory and honor. So listen, next time you're feeling down, I'm just trying to encourage you. If I see you looking down, I'm going to try to encourage you in person. But look, sometimes, man, when we feel down, let us be reminded that this is not the end. This, this is a temporary place. Yeah. Amen. God will give you joy today. I promise you he will. If we get our head right, we get our eyes fixed right on the Lord, he will help us today. The joy of the Lord can be our strength. Listen, this word is good for practical living today. I'm telling you right now. But look, it's going to be a whole lot better. <laughs> I don't know if we're going to get to swim in that crystal river of pure living life. I don't know if we're going to get to swim in it or not. But I, I like to swim, and I just have a feeling it's going to be a whole lot better than the Gulf, the Gulf of Mexico and Destin, Florida. It's, it's going to be, and look, that's going to be pretty good because, look, that water's nice, all right? Amen. All right, that's another story. So in verse 3, it says it. There will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. And his bondservants will serve him. I wanted to focus a little bit on that concept about the bondservants and that his bondservants are going to serve him. Now, I mentioned to y'all a while back about the word bondservants and how we get this idea. This has been a long history in even the Old Testament about a bond slave. Y'all remember that out of the book of Numbers. Uh, if you'll remember the story there, that that the Jewish people, God had a law within his word uh, that the Jewish people, that if they had lost their money, that, that they didn't really have a true welfare system. But what they could do was they could, in, they could sell themselves to one of their brothers. Like, in other words, they could sell their service, right? And, and it would be called a bond slave, or they would become a... a a slave to their fellow Jewish brother. But within the word of God, it said that there was something called a year of jubilee. Uh, not, I'm sorry, not a year of jubilee. Well, it was part of, it was a smaller, a jubilee is seven sets of seven years, which equals, so from the 49th to the 50th year was a jubilee, but this was a seven-year period. Some people call it a shemitah or whatever the case. But a seven-year period. At the end of the seventh year was was like a mini jubilee, if you will. And what would happen at that mini jubilee is that those that had sold themselves to their Jewish brother were released. They were they were set free. All the all that they so basically they worked off their debt. That's a much better system than just getting on the system. You know what I'm saying? Because it because look, if you just keep on bailing people out, sometimes people don't really learn. And they just keep as soon as you bail them out, boom, they get in debt again. As soon as you bail them out, Boom, they get in debt again. And But look, if you, somebody is required to work their way out of that hole, I'm telling you right now, it's going to be less likely that they're going to go get themselves in debt all over again. Why are you talking about that, preacher? You're making me feel weird because I done did it at least four times where, boom, I went right back in debt again. Boom, I went right back in debt again. Listen, I've been a debt slave, and it is not a fun place to be. And I want to tell you, though, there's hope, but you got to look. You got to have to. First of all, you got to be faithful to the Lord. If you don't believe that the Lord will bless you for tithing, your 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 ten percent. I mean, listen. I'm not even. You know me. I'm not a money preacher. But if you do not believe that the Lord is going to, can bless you. I can't pay my bills, preacher. Oh, no, 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 no. It don't work that way, my friend. You can't pay your bills because you're not trusting the Lord. The word of God says it. Test me in this. See if I will not open a window of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you are unable to contain. Number one, you better start trusting God, living a life of faith, and giving back to the kingdom of God. You call, you're part of this church. In my opinion, you should give your money to this church if you believe in what we're doing. But look, even if you don't, at least give it to somebody that you believe and trust the Lord with it. Amen? Like, don't be like, oh, but, you know, I would give my money to you over here, but I don't think. No, it's not your job to decide. You got to, you're giving it back to the Lord. And when you give it to the Lord, that's the first step. But then the second step is this. Guess what? I, don't, I didn't even plan on getting into this. We're talking about bond service. The next step is to do what's right with the other 90%. Come on, somebody. Help me out. Help me out here. All right, I'm going to stop. Bond servants, though, after that seven-year period were released, and all their debts had been paid. They worked off their debt. Amen? And then guess what? 
if they had children, if they had acquired a wife while they were a bond slave, then guess what? The wife belonged to the master. <laughs> if he had acquired children while they were in the service of the master, then the children belonged to the master. Yeah. But uh, if he went in there with the wife and the children already, then he got to leave with them. That'd be weird, huh? If you ended up having, if you had three kids and a wife and you went in there and she had another baby while y'all were there and you had to leave that one. But what it said was, was this, but if your master has been good to you and you don't want to leave, he said, put your ear to the doorpost. And you put their ear to the doorpost and, they, and they'd drive an all through it and they'd wear this little ring on their ear and it would show that they had willingly become a bond slave of their master. Willingly, desiring to be a servant of their master. Don't want to go. Where am I going to go? Just like Peter said, whenever in, in John chapter 6, and everybody's leaving because Jesus said, my flesh is true meat, my blood is true drink. And they look up, and all these disciples are leaving. And Jesus said, what, now you're going to leave me too? And Peter says, where would I go? You alone have the words of life. You're too good to leave, Jesus. Amen? You're too good to leave. Whenever your heart's been awakened to the Lord, you ain't going to want to leave him, my friend. Trust me on this. Does that mean that you're not going to have some tough times? No, I'm not saying that. But you will not want to leave the Lord. And if you try, look, once you're truly born again, I'm telling you right now, you're like, well, I just don't know if I'm born again. Good, then cry out to the Lord. I want to encourage you. Cry out to the Lord. It's not some magical prayer that we're just going to lead you through. Praying a prayer is a good thing. Asking the Lord to come into your heart is a good thing. But sometimes if you don't feel like, like the Lord's got a hook in you yet, maybe you need to get on your knees and cry out to the Lord and say, Lord, put that hook in me. Lord, put your spirit on the inside of me. Save me, Lord. I renounce the works of Satan and I, I accept your work for me on the cross. Lord, I want to serve you. Amen. You need to do that, my friend. As a matter of fact, I recommend you do that tonight before you go to bed. All right? You too watching on video. So the bond servants will serve him. So what I wanted to tell you about a servant is this. Look, and this is just, I just typed this out because it, it just feels right. And I mean, it's based on the Bible. The servant's life is given in work for his master. While this is work the master wants accomplished, it's more than work. It's work offered out of gratitude. It's worship. I want you to understand that. You got to understand what I'm trying to say right now. Listen, I am so grateful. I don't know how many times I got to tell y'all that we have a, a music ministry. I'm telling you right now. Every time I get a chance, I tell people, listen, I'm so grateful we have a music ministry. And I know y'all believe that because I tell y'all that. All right, amen? And if I haven't told y'all in a while, music ministry, I'm so grateful we have a music ministry. Amen? But can I tell you something? A worship service is only part of a worshipful life. Amen? amen? Does that make sense? Like what they're doing up here is that they're leading us in worship. And what we're supposed to be doing during worship is laying ourselves down to give glory to our king. That's really what we're supposed to be doing. We're not supposed to be in the church sitting in the pew with discriminating opinions, critiquing the way that the music sounds. That's not what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be focused on the king. Amen? Focused on the King of kings and the Lord of lords and giving him. This is not an entertainment show. There's many churches that their music ministry is an entertainment show. That's not what this is supposed to be. It's supposed to be bringing glory and honor to the king. So your part in it, my part in it, is that we're, and they're, they're supposed to be doing that too, right? The musicians are supposed to also, they're actually serving God with the gift that's been given to them. And so they're supposed to be laying their life down in that moment on that stage. They're laying their life down to bring glory and honor to the king. Amen. And so we all corporately together lay our lives down in that moment. But guess what? That's just one moment. For the rest of the day, when we walk out of the doors of this church, the rest of the day could be a worship service. Amen. Every time that you have an opportunity to not do what you want to do and instead do what the Lord told you, it's kind of a worship moment right there. Because you're laying, you're, you're a bond servant. Your God has changed you, and out of a heart of gratitude, you want to give back to him. Galatians 2.20 says, I've been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but he liveth in me. And now this life I live, I live, and now this life I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of, 
and the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See, Jesus, Jesus worshiped the Father by laying down his life so that you and I could be purchased with his blood. Now, I remember one time, the first time I was at Crossing Place Fellowship, Steve and Donna were about to leave. The youth were leading a worship service. I went up to the altar, and I heard it as clear as day. The Lord spoke to my heart and said, Matt, I need you to lay your life down for me. I laid my, this is what he said, Matt, I laid my life down for you, and now I need you to lay your life down for me so that I can use you. Amen. Praise God. And, and listen, that's really a life of worship. I just want you to understand that it's a life of, of, of sacrifice, of self, the flesh, the lies that the enemy has placed in us, the things that we want to do. No, by the grace of God, don't just try to muster up your own strength, Christian. By the grace of God that Jesus purchased for you when he died on the cross, you can be empowered and strengthened to live a life that is laid down before your master. Amen? I just want to encourage you with that. So a, a servant's life is given in work for his master, and it's offered up out of, a, out of, a, out of gratitude. Amen? And, and, hey, listen, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I know for a fact some of y'all that help work in the church, and by the way, I want to tell y'all again how much I appreciate y'all, not just the musicians, but the people that teach the kids. Wade going to help us build this building. Thank you, Wade, already before it's even done. I can see it done. It's in phase. Rob sitting on the board. All these things. Every Wade and Chari working these little cameras and stuff. I thank everybody, okay, for all that, that we do, okay? But it's offered out of a heart of gratitude, right? But if y'all was honest with me and if I asked y'all to raise y'all's hand, y'all know y'all would have to raise your hand. There's been times that you didn't feel that grateful to be able to serve the Lord. With in ministry. Come on, somebody. You ain't got to do it. I'm going to tell you right now, there's been times that I have had the wrong attitude, brothers and sisters. Am I proud of that? No. But, I, but listen, in this crazy world we live in, the things that go on, the way people act, the things people say, sometimes you get hard. Lord, I don't want to be that way. I want to be grateful. Amen? Because why? Because you're not serving me. If I got you upset last week, you weren't serving me anyway. You're serving the Lord, amen? I don't want to go around here trying to get nobody mad, but you're not serving me. We're serving Jesus together. The work is for him. You're a bond slave. You're a bond servant. Have you put your ear to the doorpost? Have you said, he's too good. Where else would I go? Who else has the words of life, amen? So we, we serve our master with a heart of gratitude because he laid his life down for us, amen? Look at this. They were singing that song, and they shall see his face. And they shall see his face. But you know what stuck out to me was this scripture here, Exodus 33, 20. And he said, you can't not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And, I mean, now we've come full circle. In the Old Testament, Moses said, I want to see your glory, Lord. If you go back and you read that story in Exodus 33, 20, Moses said, okay, you're sending me, Lord, to lead your children into the promised land. But if you're not going to go with me, I don't want to go. Isn't that a good thing? That's a good place to be, right? Because I can tell you, before Robert and I started this church, I prayed, Lord, if you're, if you're not, I don't want this because I never wanted to be a pastor. I, man, I love it now. I'm just going to be honest with you. I love being a pastor, and, and I love the opportunity to teach. I love people more than I ever knew I could love people. I just love y'all, even if, you know, I'm just telling you, I love y'all. All right. <laughs> uh, I know it doesn't always seem like it, but I do. But I told the Lord, I said, Lord, if you're not going to be in it, if you're not going before us, I don't want nothing to do with this. this. This was not some dude trying to make something happen when it came to this. I can promise you. And Moses said, Lord, you want me to do that? I'm not going to go if you don't go. I want to." And then he said this, I want to see your glory, Lord. And you know, what, you know what God told him? He said, you can't see my face. You can't see my face and live. Okay, and listen, nobody was really as close to the Lord, to the God of the Old Testament as Moses. As a matter of fact, I'm thinking I'm going to probably preach on that whenever Moses would be and the anointing would cause his face to shine and he'd cover his face and all that. The Bible says that God did speak to Moses like a man face to face. Now, he didn't see the glory of the Lord like that because then that would be a contradiction. But in some way, God revealed himself to Moses. He said, you can't see me. He said, but look, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to put you in a cleft of the rock. Amen. Isn't that good? Dude, Jesus is the rock. It's, a, it's like a hiding place. It's a secret place. He said, I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock, and then I'm going to hide you there, and then I'm going to let my glory pass before you. And you can see, you can see the glory on the, on, the, on the latter side of me. 
and, and, and he said, you know, listen, this is what I'm going to let you see. But look, in the New Testament, when it's all said and done, they shall see his face. Praise God. You're going to be able to dwell with the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and you're going to be able to see his face. Amen. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, no night, no light, because look, God gives them the light. Amen. So there's not even, there, there's no longer night. Now listen, there's so many things that can be referred to with the night. Especially John. Like again, I try to explain to y'all sometimes when you're studying the Bible and you study a particular book in the Bible, if an if if author, if the same author wrote another book and you read the other book that that author wrote, it can give you great greater understanding about what you're reading here. Now, I just happen to know this just shooting from the hip because I've read the Gospel of John so many times and I've taught the Gospel of John. But John talks over and again about the night and about darkness. The Bible in general talks over again about nighttime and darkness and how it's interconnected to, in a way, it's illustrative of sin. It's illustrative of spiritual darkness. Okay, And listen, he says there's no more night there. In the Psalm of Solomon, I talked about it a while back. It says each time that the, that the Shulamite woman, which is a type of the bride of Christ, she had a dream, and, and it was at nighttime whenever she felt as though death was trying to grab a hold of her. It was in the midst of the night. The, the foolish virgins are left in the midnight hour when it's darkest, okay? Paul said in the book of Romans, he said this. He, he said, oh, I'm sorry, in, in the letter to the Thessal Thessalonians, he talked about those that are drunk are drunk in the night. Those that sleep are asleep in the night. Jesus said, work while it is day because the night comes when no man will be able to work. So darkness in nighttime represents the fall of man, the spiritual condition that's on the face of the earth. But good news, because in that time there, there's no more night. There's no more night. There's no need of light. You see, if you make it to this point, you ain't got to be worried about putting oil in your lamp. <laughs> the oil of the lamp is flowing through the river. Amen? The oil of the lamp is flowing through the river. Praise God. All right. So this right here, what I was thinking about this, um, this light is I, I call this the switch of God. Amen? Because look, there's been darkness on the face of the earth. The sin of man has caused darkness to be upon the face of the earth, but God sent a switch to turn the, the light on and to repel the darkness, amen? The Bible teaches us in John chapter 1 that Jesus was the light that was sent from heaven, amen? And so it's like a light switch. I mean, if I could get some, I'm, I don't want y'all to do it, but if somebody would go over there and you'd flip the light, J Jesus is like the light switch of God, Amen? And this is the condemnation, though, that light is come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. You see that? The reality is, is that in this time frame that we live in, in the, in the spiritual atmosphere that we live in, men still sometimes love darkness. Because, look, the Bible says in, in John chapter 3 that whenever you come to the light, your deeds are exposed. And another reason I was thinking about the switch of God is because, look, in Christ, when you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it's a beautiful thing because, look, he gives you a reset. Amen? He gives you a reset. You come clean with the Lord. That's really and truly all you need to do. Come clean with God. Hallelujah. He gives you a fresh start. He starts from scratch, 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 from scratch. In your life, amen? As a believer, you don't have to keep living in the, in the dark. You don't have to keep loving that which is dark. The enemy will try to get you. Listen, when you first, as a, as a Christian, if you're saved here tonight, as a Christian, you, if you got the love of God on the inside of you, you don't want to love darkness. I'm going to tell you that right now. And the first step towards it, it's like painted. It's a, it's a painting that's a lie. It looks beautiful. Um, what are you talking about? Sin. Sin, when it first approaches you, looks beautiful. It smells so good. And it's so soft. I mean, it's soft and you want to touch it. 
You want to cuddle it. You want to spend time with it. Whatever it is. But I'm telling you right now, once you flip that switch, my friend, darkness begins to pervade. Darkness begins to try to quiet the light. But I got good news for you. The Lord will flip that switch for you again. Amen. And you got to start moving back towards the light, though. You got to start moving back towards the light. You can't, you can't stay in darkness. Because the longer you stay in darkness, the darker it gets. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. But you look, the thing of it is, is that wicked men, and look, not just wicked men, you and I here tonight, if we're honest with one another, that if there's things in our life, like we ain't, we ain't trying to like expose all that for the world. Come on, somebody, help me out. And listen, the spirit of God on the inside of you is not going to try to rat somebody out either because the word of God says that, you, that love covers a multitude of sins. Let, but let us get right with the Lord. Amen? If we get right with the Lord, man, we'll be right with each other because our heart will be right. Does that make sense? Praise God. You might, you, look, you can come talk to me if that's what you need to do, but I'm telling you right now, in this church, I'm trying to teach people how to talk to Jesus. He is your shepherd. He's the shepherd of your soul. Jesus loves you so much that he died on the cross to pay the penalty of your sin. You can trust Jesus. Amen? You don't have to go through a man to get to the Lord. You can go home tonight, and you can fall on your knees, and you can begin to cry out to the Lord, and you can say, Lord, I want to bring this darkness that's in me to your light, Lord. I want to bring it to your light, Lord, and I want it to be exposed to you, Lord. I mean, there's been times in my life, I'm telling you right now, where I was a Christian, and I was messed up. And when the Lord showed up in that barroom bathroom, I'm not going to go through the whole story. I can remember like two weeks later, I just, I just melted in the presence of God because I was so overwhelmed with thankfulness that for whatever reason, because I felt like the Lord said it to me. He said, you didn't get caught. <laughs> whatever I was doing, you didn't get caught. I protected you. Now you need to be grateful. You need to be grateful that that night when you was doing whatever you was doing, you didn't lose everything in one moment because of that stupidity. Amen? Amen? And listen, thank you, Jesus, overwhelmed with gratitude. Thank you, Lord. And listen, sometimes it's just about acknowledging that. I know I'm kind of going long, but maybe you find yourself in a place in your spiritual walk, and, and you're having a hard time shaking the darkness. Amen? You keep, first of all, you keep coming coming up to the front for, for prayer when we have it because we want to lay hands on you and we want to pray and we want to believe God to set you free. But listen, sometimes, man, whenever that devil's trying to overwhelm you with darkness, you just start crying out to the Lord, thank you, Lord. Thank you for your light, Lord. Thank you for your light. I want, I, I just pray, Lord God, that you would do a work on the inside of me. Amen? All right. So look, we, we could we could have gone back to John 3, 17 through 21. But I'm going to save the time because we're kind of going over right here. So look, Revelation 22, 11. Let the one, I thought this was interesting. Let the one who does wrong still do wrong, and the one who is filthy still be filthy. And let the one who is right, now this is not talking about, Jesus is saying to the angel, he's saying, let them know that I'm coming. Let them know that the time is coming soon. Okay, so what he's saying is right now, today, let the one who does wrong still do wrong. Let the one who is filthy still be filthy. You think God wants people to do wrong and to be filthy? No, of course he doesn't. You know, what, you know what he's saying? He's saying there's still going to be wickedness on the earth. There, there's a lie in the church that says called kingdom theology, kingdom now theology, that the church is going to fix everything up, whitewash it, make it look pretty, and we're going to get it just right, and then the Lord's finally going to come home. That's a lie from the pit of hell. The church ain't going to fix nothing. As a matter of fact, most of the time, the church ain't even right. They're not even following according to the word of the Lord. What's going to fix it is that the, you're going to let the Lord get into your heart. The kingdom of God's going to come alive in you. You're going to do the work of the Lord on the earth, amen, and then one day, hallelujah, Jesus is going to come back, and he's going to make it all right. The Prince of Peace is going to rule from the throne of David. Amen. And peace is going to be on the earth. Hallelujah. That's how it's going to come. And in the meantime, the church is supposed to proclaim the truth, be filled with the Spirit of God, do the work of the Lord, be a witness for the King of kings and Lord of lords, tell people that are in darkness that there is a light. Amen. And that there's a light switch. His name is Jesus. And he can turn it on on the inside of you. And the light of God, amen, can touch other people's lives. But look, let the, so you're not going to change everybody. 
that doesn't mean that you don't die trying <laughs> to give them the good news of the gospel. Amen? But at the same time, you need to understand there's still going to do, be people doing wrong, still going to be people that are filthy, and they're going to love their darkness, and let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness. Let the one who is holy still keep himself holy. Amen? So there's going to be people on, there's people of the Lord. You know, this is a very powerful thought. I want you to know that. You know, we've got a couple young people in here tonight. A little bit of a middle-of-the-road walk with God is not okay with the Lord. What, I'm trying, what are you trying to say? You either, we're either in or we're out. Like, there's a lot of people that say they love God, but what, we, y'all, what we're talking about tonight is being a servant of the Lord. And a servant of the Lord gives his life back to God. Amen? The decisions that he makes throughout his life, whether it's a job, whether it's what he goes to school for, whatever the case He includes the Lord in the decisions that he makes because he is not his own. The Bible teaches that we were bought with a price. The price that you and I were bought with was the blood of Jesus. Amen? Praise God. Revelation 22, 12. Behold, I am coming quickly. I like this. And my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. God's got a reward. Amen? You ever been, y'all ever heard of the seeker-sensitive movement? I know some of y'all have. It's a big movement in the church. Big movement in the church where they don't really want to sing songs about the cross. They don't want to sing about the blood. They don't want to talk about sin from behind the pulpit because they think you're going to offend people and people aren't going to want to come back to church. Okay, but the, the Bible is full of the word sin. The Bible is full of the word of blood and the cross, right? It says right here, Behold, I am coming quickly. My reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. Listen, this is not going to go over well in a seeker sensitive church, all right? Because look what it says. Here's the reward. This is a Greek word. I wrote it in there, mystos. But look, this is what it means. Payment, good or bad. The reward Jesus has is a payment, and it can be either good or or bad. What I put right here is there's, there's a payday coming. Jesus wants people to know there's a payday coming. And listen, it's not because you can do all the right stuff and you're going to get your good payday. No, you gave your life to Christ. You let the Holy Spirit take over. Amen. You became a servant of the Lord. And because of the life of God on the inside of you, you practiced righteousness. You became a witness for the Lord, a servant for the Lord. You spread the good news of Jesus Christ to those that were in darkness. That's what you did because that's who you were. You became born again. The old man that was born of Adam died and a new man was resurrected the newness of life and now the life of God is living on the inside of you and guess what's supposed to come out of you? Jesus. (laughs) Jesus. The precious name of Jesus. And whenever we live that way, he's got a reward for us. Amen. Praise God. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright and morning star. I I think that's so interesting to think about that, the bright and morning star. And look, I want to show you the scripture right here. 1 Peter 1.19. Until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. As a matter of fact, let's just go to that scripture real quick. 1 Peter 1. And then 19, and let's see here. Let's go up a little bit. Maybe uh, I think that was the right scripture, huh? No, that's not, that's not it. I think it was Second Peter, was it? No, it was First Peter. Maybe I got the wrong scripture on this. I'm sorry, y'all. I must have got the wrong scripture. But the idea is, is this, is that the holy prophets of old spoke by the presence of the Holy Spirit and that he says that there came a day when the day star rose in your life. Let's see here. I know I've kind of, I'm not going to stress out over it because I can easily find it right here and it won't. And I mean, I think y'all still love me even if I don't get it. Yeah, here you go. That was Second Peter. There we go. I'm almost done. Y'all hang in there with me. I think this is it. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. So basically what Peter's saying is this. 
We were with him on the Mount of Transfiguration. We saw him, his deity, shine through him. And so now we're here to tell you that story. And he said, look, you would do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. Look at this. Until the day dawns. This is the part I wanted you to see. And the morning star arises in your heart. The King James Version says this. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well, that you take heed as unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn, and look at this, and the day star arise in your hearts. You know what's interesting is that scholars say that this day star, this morning star spoken of right here, is actually talking about like astronomically, not astrologically. But according to astronomy, that this is the planet Venus. And that when the night is darkest, right preceding, right before the sun rises, you can see this day star in the sky. And it's showing you that the night's about to be over. That the night's about to be over and that the dawn is about to break. And what we're talking about right here in the book of Revelation is that there's been ages of nighttime. But that when God finally fulfills everything, that there will be no more night, there will be no more need of light. You won't have to have electricity. You won't have to have a candle because Jesus, the light of the world, will be the light thereof. Amen. And in the meantime, you would do well to heed this word of God until that day star rises in your heart. Has the day star risen in your heart? Amen. I know y'all are tired, and I know that I'm going on too long, but I hope that the day star has risen in your heart. And if it has, then you have the hope of glory living on the inside of you. Amen? Praise God. We're closing with this. Revelation 22, 17. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that hears say, come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Amen. Jesus is looking for a bride, my friend. Jesus is the groom, and he's looking for a bride. And the Spirit is, call, the Spirit is giving invitation to the wedding. Amen. And you know who he uses to invite? You. He uses you, he uses me, to invite people to the wedding. Amen. He fills you with the Holy Spirit, and he says, hey, go invite them to the wedding. Jesus is looking for a bride. Amen. And he wants you and I to invite them to the wedding. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I lift up everyone that might have watched by video, Lord. I'll lift up the people that are in the sanctuary tonight. I pray, Lord, that you would fill us to overflowing with your Holy Spirit. I pray that that day star would rise up on the inside of our hearts, Lord, and that we would have a desire to tell others the good news of Jesus Christ, Lord. We pray that you would go before us, that you would show us your glory, Lord, that you would open up our eyes, that we want to see your face, Lord. We want to be close to you. We want to walk with you, O oh Lord. We pray, Lord God, that you would use us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. If you need prayer, the altars are open. Amen. I want to pray with you.